here. Our farm's located uh, in the Bay of Islands, Northland, and southeast, just on the southeast of Kawaka. And it, it's about uh, 20 minutes drive to fire here. And it's um, on steep hill country with hugely varying soil types. Most of it's heavy clay or podzol, a little bit of ironstone. The history of the farm is um, my grandfather Cookson came here in uh, 1902 and he was a hat maker in um, the Midlands and then the industrial revolution revolutionized hat making and so he was he was broken without a job and he came to Christchurch and married a lady from Christchurch and then they came up here a couple of years later and uh, I think my old man was two when he came here and him and his him and his brother now my grandfather wasn't a wasn't a farmer he worked on the railway, building the railway bridges when they were building them from Auckland. And uh, there was no road transport to Auckland, they used to have to go to Auckland on the scow. At any rate, my uncle and my father milked 10 cows each by hand morning and night, and my uncle worked at the freezing works, and my father worked at the hospital as a stoker. And they'd come home at night and milk their 10 cows and milk them in the morning before they went to work. And they slowly built up and my uncle kept working at the works and my father was a farmer. And they slowly got up to 40 cows, which was quite a lot. And uh, then I got up to 60 and they split up the farm in half. And my uncle took one half and had his herd and mine and had his. The farm was about 700 acres, I think. And we ended up with 400 on this side and my uncle had 350 on the other side of the road. I think that's roughly how they split it up. And they, they started farming and the, everyone was a dairy farmer in those days. There are little cow sheds all around the valleys and everywhere. My old man started off town supply when oh, probably yeah, 70 years ago. When I was just a little fella. He started off, they had the milk in the big cream cans and he had an old 300 weight Fargo chuck. And he used to get up at one o'clock in the morning and go and deliver the milk around Kaukau and Morua. And then uh, he'd come home at about half past six, milk the cows, work all day on the farm, milk the cows at night. And uh, I can remember him counting the tokens. They had little tokens to buy the milk with. And he'd be fall asleep counting the tokens. And I'd be getting the tiki berries from down there on the other side of his shirt. Eh? <laughs> I went to, went to school locally and I had a a year at Massey, which was really good. And then I had three months in the army, which was a waste of time, it was compulsory. And uh, I could have sprayed a lot of gorse instead of being in the army for three months. And uh, yeah, we kept the, kept the herd. We ended up with a 240 gallon town supply quota. And we'd milk about 120 cows in the winter and 160 in the summer. But it's not really dairy in country, as you'll see. In 1973, we made a decision to sell a herd and just run steers. But no one ran bulls then. And we'd been doing, we'd had quite a few steers. We had about 700 steers on, because we bought a little bit more land here and there. And uh, we were making quite good dough out of them, and it'd be less stressful and a better lifestyle. And yeah, that was the best thing we ever did. I got a life after that. <laughs> I didn't get married till I was 40. That was tons soon enough, eh? <laughs> and uh, no, 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 it's good. And I've got three kids. And they're all neat kids. They're all different. And none of them want to be farmers. But uh, they're, 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 they're real, we're really enjoying my kids. One of them's finally taking up diving and I'm um, teaching her to dive. Done little trials and had a bit to do with um, clover root weevil and uh, Totra Working Group and Clover 3000 and Gavin Usher and all those that sort of stuff and pugging and probably the biggest limit to production is the pugging in the winter uh, and so we've done a lot of subdivision and I try not to winter too many heavy cattle. I, I try to keep everything under 400 kilos during the winter. 
and, and just the contour makes it quite difficult. I'd love to sow my manure by tractor and put it exactly the right amount in the right place, but it's not practical, so we sow it by plane. Yeah, the kikuya is, is, is good in that it grows reasonably well even when it's dry and it provides cover. But when you get a summer like this summer where it's hot and wet, it just grows really, really too well. And it's not a true grass. True grass um, grows, grows up from the bottom and the oldest bit is at the tip, whereas kikuya grows out the tip and so the oldest bit's at the bottom. So no matter how much you chew the top, you've still got this real old stuff at the bottom. And uh, the, the emmy of it just disappears right off the bottom of the Richter scale. So they can eat as much as that old stolon as they like and they're going to die of starvation because there's not enough goodness in it. And it takes 30 days for that old stolon to go through the digestive system. So it's like lumps of rope. So I think I'll have to, I'll, I'll graze it as hard as I can with stock, not calves and not stock you're trying to fatten, but just store 18 months cattle. And then I'll mulch what I can and just try and slowly get it back under control. But it's going to be a bit of a mission. The first year we put the techno in, we didn't do our sums very well. And we were giving them a cell and a half every two days. And I got it halfway up the techno and I thought, hell, there's a lot of grass in front of us. And we should have been giving them a cell and a half a day. So we're double the stocking rate. It was huge, but it was a dry kind winter. It was amazing, yeah. But we've never had a winter like it since. <laughs> but yeah, just the pasture control is, is, is uh, probably the biggest thing. And we've whittled away and got a good water system in and as we've developed and fenced off the gullies. And we spent a lot of time fencing off waterways and gullies and started in 1984. We called it erosion control scheme. The water supply is all, we've got these deep gullies that are hard rock in the bottom that don't dry up and uh, we've got we've got five five uh, reciprocating pumps down in the gullies. One's, oh, one's driven by petrol because it costs too much to get the power there and the other is all on the power and uh, they pump the header tanks on the hill and we grow and feed from the header tanks on the hill. And it works really good, just a bit of pump maintenance, and yeah, it's good. But it's, uh, yeah, quite expensive, more expensive than fencing. You know. But yeah, that's made a big difference. We've got water everywhere now. We put a trough under the fence line between two paddocks, and most of our troughs are concrete with an old conventional uh, borecock in them. But we've got some techno troughs on you can't have them over too great a pressure so we've on a flat techno block and some round close to the tanks we've got them and uh the, the uh, techno troughs and the bulls uh dug one out of the ground once and uh, it was on about 30 feet of pipe and rolling around down the hillside they were bunting it kicking it and trying to get the water out of it and they didn't break it in, in may or, or a bit before, but after we set up our blocks for the winter, the whole farm for the winter, and we have 10 hectare blocks, and depending on the class of cattle and the, the type of country, like there's some of it's very wet, we put our little calves on, and we might only have them on at 700 kilograms beef to the hectare, and in our drier ironstone country, we'll have a bigger cattle onto maybe a thousand or so kilograms of beef per hectare. And we're all over, just about all our paddocks are one hectare, and so they each mob has their ten hectares to go around, and we fence them into into three to start with, so they have two days in each break, and so that makes a sixty day rotation. And then the second time around, we fence them in half, and they have two days in each half, and that's a forty day rotation. And after a hundred days, we we'll find we're just about through the winter. We either are or, we, or it's close, and and then we might we just keep going until we can see we've got enough grass to give them a whole paddock for three days and then we have a 30-day rotation 
and we more or less continue on with that till we start killing some or if the grass grows exponentially we will buy another mob and we'll give those only eight paddocks so they've, they've only got a 24 day rotation you see and we mickey mouse around with it and we get it wrong sometimes and in the winter we try and have a weight gain on our little cattle of about it varies from 0.3 to 0.6 and uh, in our big cattle we might not make much weight gain at all because we've got them stacked on pretty steep but then in the spring as the grass grows away they go through the spring for my, my yearlings um, calves are 1.5 a day and for the big cattle 2.5 you know, we, we want to be here for forever and ever, or for a long time anyhow. And uh, that's why I'm, I don't try and overstock in the, in the winter, because of the, the um, effect on the environment. It all, all the tops all end up out there in the Bay of Islands. And you can't see the bottom of Russell, Russell Wharf anymore. <laughs> Used to be able to see it all the time. Three pieces of advice are, get a profitable business, you know, do the homework, Hey, look, we can do this, this, we can make money, enough money to pay our wages and pay the mortgage. And then the second thing is pay it off as quick as you can before they change the rules. <laughs> and the third thing is have lots of fun while you're still young.